We're going to tell each other what we uh, believe. And from that point then, we're going to pray again. But this time, we're going to pray for other people. Because now we've heard the word of God, and we know that it isn't about us. So now we pray for other people. And then we're going to have an invitation to confess our sins. And then we're going to give our tithes and our offerings. Because that is a response to knowing whose we are and not who we are. And after that, then we're going to respond again by taking Holy Communion. Because that is the most intimate way to respond to the Word of God. And then we're going to close out and go home. Now, the reason I thought that was essential to share, take my sermon time for it, is because as we have been working through Kenda Dean's book, Almost, Almost Christian, she, she, she has three things that she says are essential if we're going to move from this moralistic, therapeutic, the, the, the uh, deism thing where God is there to make me moral. Follow all the rules to be a good girl and a good boy, to not have sex when I'm not supposed to, to not be drunk, to not steal, to not cheat, to not do all that stuff. And then it's supposed to be therapeutic. God's supposed to make me feel good. Jesus loves me, this I know, and that's all that really matters. If I never respond to it, it doesn't matter. I feel good because Jesus loves me. And then the last was the reason we could be that way is because God really isn't active in everyday life. He's deist. He made us, he's out there, and he's just sitting back and watching. And you know what? Some of us have learned that really well. Some of us have been taught that really well. And what Kenneth Dean says has been lost. The one of the reasons that we got to where we are, one of the reasons that Pastor Rick doesn't like this service, one of the reasons, and I'm, I'm not throwing her under the bus because we shared, that we don't like liturgy, and she writes beautiful liturgy. I can't write liturgy. I can't. It, it, it's, it's not real good. The reason I don't like it is because it's just words. I want to hear when we read the prayer of illumination this morning, and I don't want you to throw them under the bus. But I am not going to go too far out on a limb and probably think that, blessed Lord, we've entered, caused all the Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Grant us to hear them, read them, mark them, and we're really to adjust them, embrace them, hold fast. And there's a good chance that's what happened. For some of them. For others, maybe it didn't. But it happens, and particularly for a song like the Gloria Patri, for those of us who grew up in the church, you sang it every that blinks a day. And nobody ever told me why we sang the song the same thing every, every week. Why do we do that? Why? Because I'm not sure they knew why. Or somebody decided it wasn't important, and that's what Dean says, that the art of translation needs to be used. That's step one, to move us from moralistic, therapeutic, the, the ideas of the church is a good thing, we feel good, da 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 da, da it's really nice. But to get into living Christ, we need to be able to have it translated. One of the things I had this morning, and I was going to use I got some slides and I just decided it took too much time. And I had slides of the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic and Czechoslovakian and whatever language that we could, that we could imagine. And I was going to put them on the screen and you'd have no idea on, on, on what it was. And yet, I'll bet almost every one of you would close your eyes and recite the Lord's Prayer in your sleep. But if you saw it in another language, would it mean nothing? That's one step of translating, is you've got to get it in a language that you understand. So Dean is saying this, and she shared a story, which I think is really interesting. Is that all the computer whizzes in the room? Do we have any coders in here? Do you write the program? Okay. So Cindy's going to understand that the, the, the absolute best. But Kevin Dean said that there was, there was, there, 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 this, this was a true story, that they were creating a program to translate English-Russian, Russian-English. All right? So they decided that into the computer that they typed in the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. All right? Out of sight, out of mind. My guess is there's no one here that doesn't know what I mean when I say out of sight and out of mind. All right? So they typed it into the computer, the 
translation comes out, and the translation from the computer is blind idiot. <laughs> now think about it. If you don't understand American nuance in language, and you don't understand our colloquialisms or whatever other phrases you want to use, the computer is you can tell me to shut up, whatever I go, I, I go wrong. It's basically on off. You know, if you're going binary, it's either on or it's off. You know, it, it is very mechanical. It is very good at knowing a lot of things, but it can't read body language. It can't read our, 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 the way we say things. So there it is, out of sight, out of mind, is blind idiot. Blind idiot. Can you imagine if you came into this country, understood English, but you didn't know our culture, and you went to a theater in Las Vegas about 15 years ago, for those of us who are a little older, and you went in and Don Rickles was on the stage. And you walked in while he was talking to somebody in the first couple of rows and calling them names, insulting them, their family, their, their race, their gender, their heritage. He was, he was letting them all have it. You'd be a little bit like that computer. What would you interpret? Yet, as Americans, we understand comedy, and we understand sarcasm as comedy, and separate from sarcasm as rudeness. We understand all of that. However, not the case. If you don't understand the culture, if the culture has never been translated, not just the language of the Lord's Prayer, but the culture. We say the Lord's Prayer, but do we know why Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer? It's a whole other sermon, because in that is how every prayer that you pray should be organized. And the first and foremost, the first words, our Father. You better give glory where glory is due first. Another sermon, we're going to go there another time. So, suppose I sent you to the grocery store and told you to go buy pop. How many of you would grab your father or grandfather? <laughs> For those of you in the South, you would know exactly what I meant. If I told you to go get soda in New England or in Maryland and North, you would go buy soft drink. In some parts of the country, you would go look for salsa or salsa water, whatever the heck that is. All right? Suppose I told you to go to the kitchen and get a biscuit. For those of you who are from my part of town, that means you better come back with gravy in it. <laughs> but if you're English, you're going to bring back a cookie. The words were correct. The language wasn't wrong, but the cultural translation was wrong. And that's what the church has lost. We don't know why we do what we do, and we're not passing it on to anybody else. And we look at our kids and our young folks and we go, man, they just don't care about nothing. And we've talked the last couple of weeks. They care about exactly what we've taught them to care about. We've taught them to be, to be good, to be nice, to all, all which is good stuff. But we've not taught them that Jesus is the most important thing in their life and why. Walter Brueggemann, a father and a great theologian, writes, he says to this point, he says, translators, obviously computers don't make great translators. People do, not programs. So Brueggemann talked about 2 Kings 18 to 19. I'm not going to read all that. We're not going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go. But in the, in the short is, this is where the Jews were in Jerusalem behind the wall, and the Assyrians were attacking from the outside. Now, the Assyrians weren't just because a huge army, and they were going to come in and just wipe them out. But the Assyrians decided they wanted to negotiate from the top of the wall. So the Jews would meet them at the top of the wall, the Assyrians, and, and there would be conversation on the wall. And that conversation on the wall was in Aramaic. Because that's what the Assyrians spoke. Right, so there's one, there's a language change. So, and up there, the Assyrians are talking and they're making fun of the Jews. You all, uh, we're just going to run over you, we're going to wipe you out, you're stupid, you got to go. 
you, you need to negotiate, just surrender. Just give it up. So the Jews were up there, and they spent time with the Assyrians in Aramaic, and then what Brueggemann says, there was conversation behind the wall. And he says it's conversation behind the walls that makes the difference. So when they went back and spoke to their people, they spoke in Hebrew. Now, this wasn't just because they could fool the other side in case they could hear them. They spoke in Hebrew, and what they spoke about is they spoke about Yahweh. This is what the Assyrians are saying. This is what they want to do to us. This is what they want us to do. This is what, and they would say, but Yahweh. They couldn't talk to the Assyrians about Yahweh because they didn't know who Yahweh was. It didn't matter to them. But the message behind the wall was Yahweh says he will be with us. Yahweh says we will get out the other side. Yahweh has promised. Yahweh doesn't lie. Yahweh will always be there. Brueggemann says it's the conversations behind the wall that are essential to share in the community. However, if you never go on the wall or outside, then you're lost. We said, you know, you got to be in the world and not of the world. In other words, you've got to get outside the walls of this church. It doesn't do any good for us to just tell us what our language means in here and what it means. We've got to translate it outside to a lost world because they're lost. So the negotiations on the wall in Aramaic, behind the wall, was in Hebrew. In Hebrew. And Dean says that the information is often hard to translate. And, and that if we're going to translate the message of Jesus Christ to, to our youth, or even those who are just disconnected from the church in general, then we need to do it in the most efficient way, and that is not book or machine, but person to person. That means we need to tell them what Jesus is in our life. Now, that is not a license for us to do what the church has done over many generations, and that's to create a Jesus that fits us. We create a Jesus that we like, and you go, well, it's not biblical completely, but it's sort of biblical, and I like this Jesus better than the one described in the Bible. And don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. People do it all the time. I don't like it. I like the Jesus thing. That whole resurrection and things kind of spooky to me. People don't like it when I talk about this ghost. I don't remember Jesus saying, go talk about what you like to talk about. Our job is to translate. As older people in the church, that's what used to happen. In the tribes, the medicine men and medicine women and, 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 and the wise women and men, the gray hair was a mantle of wisdom and understanding. That's where we went to find that information. And they would translate what was confusing into what was understandable. So who translates? You can't make it up. But who translates? That means some of us are going to encounter Christ in music. Some of us are going to encounter Christ in liturgy. Some of us are going to encounter Christ not in liturgy. But how do we translate the message of Christ, whether it's liturgical or non-liturgical? Or whether it's in gospel or it's in classical? Or whether it's in whatever it's in? Someone's got to translate Dean says that God translated, though, to us in the way that we have to translate. God translated by becoming incarnate. He became human, person to person. And he became human not because we earned it, but because he loved us. And that's how human love through Christ needs to be translated. And sometimes it's translated in a Gloria Patri, and sometimes it's translated in Kirk Franklin. And sometimes it's translated in the King James, and sometimes it's translated in the NLT. But people want to know why we're doing what we're doing. We learn best what we love most. Think about that. If you like to research, because I had a friend of mine who was one of those guys who, who read the back of a record album. 
I didn't know anything about it. He would, and he would tell me, oh, you got to listen to this artist, you know? And I would say, I, I, I've heard him, but I don't like him. He said, no, no, no. He said, the same guy who plays guitar on her album plays on this one and this one. He bought the album because so-and-so played the guitar for all three artists, not because of the artist. Heck, I didn't even know that stuff was listed on the back of the album. Why did he research that? Because he liked it. Not because he liked to research. Because he didn't research other things, because I sat in class with, said, with a boy in high school. And I knew he didn't like to research in science, but I did. We research what we, we go after what we like. So we've got to, if we don't like Jesus, we don't know him well enough to know what we're looking for, then how do we research it? How do we translate it? Look at the gospel, or the, the epistle this morning. But you, Timothy, you certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose is. You know my faith, you know my patience, my love, my endurance. You know how much by persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about me. I was preached in Antioch and Iconium and, and, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Now, so what's the point here? The point here is Paul taught Timothy. Everything Timothy knew, he learned from Paul. So what he's saying is, Timothy knows Paul. He knows his nuance and his language. He wasn't going to misread him. Because he knew what Paul meant. He understood what he believed. So when he used an analogy, Timothy understood it, which other people may not have. They may not have, but it was Timothy's job to translate that. Human to human in a personal way. Then in verse 12, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. Now here's some options of translating that, and this is what the world does. So the question is, so how are we translating? Well, we saw God's mean. God's an angry God and just hates people. So you're going to persecute. You're just going to suffer. Deal with it. That's just the way God is. Heard that one? That's sort of a goes along with the next one. Well, God's just sort of out there anyway. It's really not involved. There's the deist. He's, he's, he's there. You know, you, 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 you just didn't get your way, so God's mean. Life is just awful. It's just like a giant vacuum. It's terrible. Or, here's one the church got real good at. Well, you know, your life wouldn't be such a mess if you weren't such a sinner. The only reason your life's a mess is because you don't know Jesus. So that's what comes out. And I'm not saying that's not true, that, that, but God's not punishing you, but your separation can, can create that. You're, you're, that but, but pointing someone's sin out is not going to make life any better at this point. Verse 13, but evil people and imposters will flourish and deceive all the, 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 the others and will themselves be deceived. So see, evil's going to win anyway. No, 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 no. What he's saying is, stop thinking the world is going to be all roses and unicorns. Bad people are going to survive. Bad things happen. Sometimes they're not as bad as you think that they, uh, they are. But what is constant is that Christ will be with you through every step of that. And that changes the persecution. That changes the oppression. That changes the death. That changes whatever it is because Jesus is with you. But if no one translates like it said, if, if no, none of us are teaching that in, it says, in our homes, if no one's teaching that in our classes and downstairs, if no one's teaching that, if no one's coming to adult classes to find that out, then guess what? It didn't get translated. But you must remain faithful to the things that have been taught. You know they are true, for you know that you can trust things who trust those who taught you. Do you hear that in 14? You trust those who taught you. You've got to get a relationship with those that you're going to teach. What is true and what has been taught? That's the question I'm going to ask us. So what, is, so what do you believe is true, and what have you taught? Now, I'm not just smacking you. I'm putting myself in here, too, because I'm not sure that we know what's true, and if we don't find out what's, what is true, we can't translate it. We can't teach it. Verse 15 says, You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, 
and they have been and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ. True or false? The question is, what is our behind the wall language? Do we even have one? In fact, there are those who would say that we do. That we come in here, and if you come from the outside, uh, maybe said 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 we got things in the narthex, in the vestibule, and 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 we're going to have the U the Eucharist for uh, today. Uh, uh, said said uh, said we're going to uh, said we're going to we're going to read from an epistle today, and uh, we're and 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 we're gonna, we're going to do a tithing, and we're going to do all these, and we're all sitting there going, yeah, so, and the people outside are going. So where's the secret word to handshake? We don't have one here. We'll have one in either church. But, you know, did uh, anybody go to the sacristy for this morning? Hmm. For those of you who are raised in the right tradition, that's simply where Holy Communion is prepared and cleaned up. Usually room for the pastor or someone to put the robe on. It has a sink in it. Clean up. Sacristy. I'm not saying we shouldn't learn words that we that we, that we don't know, but as a church, we can translate. So today you get to come to the table. Today you get to come to the table. The table's been celebrated in many languages. Like I said, all I said already, our, our little girl Glory of Glory is celebrated in Uganda in her own language. But today, what do we translate in Holy Communion? I don't care what the language is. I don't care if we're breaking bread. I don't care if we're using a wafer. What, what is the translation of the message and in our faith? Our faith, it is not that the bread becomes the body of Christ. It is not that the blood becomes the blood of Christ, that the wine becomes the blood of Christ's juice. It's that this is an intimate sharing of Christ's life that he did with his disciples. And it's given to us and it's not earned. It's for forgiveness and a salvation experience. Now, you know what is unique when we get up here? Even though United Methodists don't believe in transubstantiation, that's the big word you want to know for church, where the, bot, where the bread becomes the body and the juice becomes the blood, Wesley is very clear that it is more than what the Reforms say, that it's just a reenactment. My buddies in the Baptist church this morning are having this, and they believe it is a reenactment. And Wesley and Luther and others say, no, 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 no. There is something miraculous that happens here. It isn't a body and blood thing, but it is something miraculous. And that's the translation that we have to give. That's the message. Is it being passed on? It's cute to come up and get it. But when do we get that message across? When do we share that today we are called to translate God's message? From one generation to the next. And it's not about getting what we want all the time. It's about getting what we need. And that is a living God who loved us so much, he came down in human form to translate an understanding of how much he loves us. He knew the scripture just wasn't getting it. And part of the plan, it wasn't because he failed, it was all part of the plan. Everything was gradual, we're gonna give him scripture. And we're going to give them this. We're going to give them this. And then, then they're going to get me. It wasn't that he made a mistake. God didn't make mistakes. It was all part of the plan. When we say God's plan, that's what you should be translating. Not that you get a new Mercedes. That might be part of the plan. I have no idea, but I'm guessing it may not be. Not that everything in life is going to go perfect. Ask for it. Absolutely. But what you will get is you will get a Savior that will take you through it. All the way. No questions asked. That's the message for translating today. Amen. Amen. If you would join with me, and I'm going to ask you to stand as, as you are able. Our Apostles' Creed will be here on the screen. And I want you to respond to this one. I've just told you what I believe the translation is. Now is your chance to confirm on whether you truly believe it or not. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me be seated. Let us come before the Lord in this time.